Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we're, uh, welcome, uh, we're glad to welcome you uh, at this issue briefing about uh, fintech, the future of finance. Uh, my name is Peter Vanham. Uh, I work with the World Economic Forum as a media lead, and uh, I'll be the moderator of this session. And for this session, uh, we have two uh, great guests uh, sitting right next to me is Bo Lu. Uh, Bo is um, the founder of Future Advisor, uh, is a company active in wealth uh, management. Uh, and uh, uh, to say it with another term, in robo-advising. Uh, his background is mostly uh, in computer science. And then next to uh, him is uh, John Flint, uh, the eminence grise, we would say in French, of uh, the banking industry, 26 years of experience uh, with HSBC uh, across several continents and now the head of the retail banking segment of the bank. And we're going to be talking uh, today about that future of financial services and most particularly about fintech and even more particularly uh, about uh, the wealth management part of it. Mm -hmm. And so I want to start uh, with you, Bo. Um, uh, you sit next to a man who has 26 years of experience mm -hmm. in, uh, in banking, mm -hmm. who looks like a banker <laughs> uh, also. Oh uh, uh, and you have, you're act active in the same sector. Mm -hmm. Why uh, would people and why do people trust you for uh, wealth management? And, uh, and where are we right now uh, in uh, that sector? It's a great question. Uh, and I'll say, you know, given your 26 years of experience, you've probably forgotten more than I know. Uh, but the core uh, experience of that has always been the way that people have gotten asset management delivered. But I think client expectations are changing. Uh, I mean, the primary driver here is that there's a more convenient client experience to be had if you have a great digital mobile experience that's at your fingertips all the time. I mean, in banking, many of us no longer go to the bank because we can do it all on our phone. And I think in asset management, there's nothing, there's no reason to expect that you know, it'll be different for some fundamental way. And this comes from the big things, the little things, such as you know, reading a PDF report of an 11 by, or, or 8 and a half by 11 or an A4 piece of paper on your phone is actually really, really difficult. Uh, and so there's a better uh, mechanism and a better way to communicate with our clients. I think the secondary driver is kind of underlying all this is that not only is it a great digital experience that I think uh, more and more clients will demand, but that automation drives down costs and enables better control and compliance, right? Um, and this gives firm scale, allows firms to not only better serve their existing clients, but to address a new segment of clients uh, that have traditionally been unserved by wealth management. I think your question about you know, where we are uh, and you know, why do folks trust us, us, you know, small tech companies is that the answer really is not everyone will, right? And the vast, vast majority of assets are still with traditional financial institutions. Um, but not everyone will at first. And I think, but enough will. And a small portion, and that portion will grow over time. I mean, our memories are short, but I'll recall that back in the 90s, you recall that e-commerce was like this in the early days. People would say, why would I ever give my credit card to a website? And today, nobody says, what's Amazon going to do with my credit card number? Right? Like, it's just a fact of life. And so I think it's a combination of, uh, you know, it'll appear small for a while, but it'll continue to grow at a rapid pace. OK, well, uh, let me take it uh, one more uh, step down. Mm -hmm. um, if I go to my bank, um, uh, I'm, and I'm still used to uh, going to my advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I asked him, what should I invest in or what, where should I put my money in? Uh, there's a factor of trust and he'll give me s some recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, so why are people in the same situation? Why would I, mm. as a person, come to you and why do people do that? I think a couple of things. Right? On the personal level, I mean more. Yeah. yeah. One is uh, ease. I think we should uh, never under underestimate the power of convenience in marketplaces. You know, there's a great saying in, in Silicon Valley where we're based that the most convenient option usually wins eventually. Uh, and the second one is, um, whereas you know, the vector of trust in a human-to-human -human relationship is that they work for the bank, I've heard of the bank, the vector of trust in digital oftentimes is transparency. And so, we'll, you know, for example, we will, for free in under a minute, take a look at all of your assets, regardless of where they might be, uh, at least in the United States so far, uh, and give you a all-up view and give you a, a set of recommendations and then give you a bunch of reasons, level by level, why those recommendations are made if you want to do the math yourself. Okay. And um, right now, how, big is, how many clients are actually buying into that? Um? I think the entire uh, you know, robo uh, sector in the U.S. is probably somewhere on the order of tens of billions of dollars. Okay, so um, we've got, of course, next to you, uh, someone uh, who knows all about uh, numbers uh, uh, and has been working with them for 26 years, as we said. 
so uh, from your perspective, which is that of a traditional bank, if I may say, you, you at some point you even said the boring bank, um, <laughs> how do you see the entrance of these new players into the market? Um, it's healthy. Um, it represents a challenge for the incumbents, but I think it's a good challenge. And it's a good challenge because the end result is better customer experience. I don't think you know, the, the foundations of what we do, our purpose, is not in any way disrupted by fintech or by new technologies. Um, but this puts uh, pressure on us to really focus on the customer experience and on the ownership of, um, of the customer journeys. And I think that's really where the, the, the battle ultimately is going to be won and lost. And one of the things I've really enjoyed um, since I started attending Davos is how the, the conversation between the incumbents and the disruptors has evolved. And in my first Davos, I felt very uncomfortable because there was almost open hostility between um, the, the disruptors and, 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 if you like, the old world. This year, there's a much healthier debate around how we're going to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the reality is, we're of, you know, incumbents like us, we've been around for 150 years. Uh, customers have made a conscious decision to trust us to look after one and a half trillion dollars of their deposits. And trust is what we do. It's our foundation stone. Fintech shouldn't disrupt that. But it really does put, put the onus on us to really understand how we're dealing with our, with our customer experience. And firms like the one that Bo has founded um, uh, just intensify that for us. And we have, a we have a challenge here to respond or not. If we stick our heads in the sand, the risk for the incumbents is that over time, our customers will prefer the convenience and the ease and the simplicity that the disruptors can provide. Um, and it's, it will take time, but the pressure is absolutely real. Right. Uh, now, you talk about time, but of course, uh, a lot has already happened in the last, let's say, 12 to 24 months. Um, and also here at Davos and at the World Economic Forum, we've seen that evolve. Um, we've seen basically uh, the reaction of uh, uh, the traditional banking sector to go, go from uh, it's a non-factor to we're maybe afraid, we're worried, yeah. uh, to in the end, we have to do something about it. And that, and that actually has happened, and both of you have reacted in a different way. Um, that is to say, if you look, for example, at Bo, uh, uh, you, you look, of course, like you are the new player in the market, but as, as a matter of fact, as of very recently, mm -hmm. you are actually an old player in the market because you've been acquired by BlackRock. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that change uh, your business model? It doesn't really, because one of the interesting things is uh, that we've been hearing from both sides kind of the same story, which is ever since our company got initial traction, we were getting inbound calls from banks and brokerages that were saying, hey, is there any way that you can help us uh, cross this digital divide and help us with our digital initiatives internally? Meanwhile, uh, when, we're, when we're talking to customers, not, they love the product, but sometimes they say, look, it is really nice, but I got to move a bunch of stuff everywhere. I already trust my existing financial institution. Why can't I just get this where my money is today? And so you know, we sat down and said, hey, look, both sides are really telling us the same thing, and then the market has spoken. Uh, and that led to our collaboration with BlackRock. We've actually known them for a long time, but that led to our, uh, our eventual collaboration with BlackRock. And I think um, if you drill a level down, I think many of those uh, here and those watching are probably in financial services, there's actually a great complement between our two models, right? There's, I mean, digital is not going to you know, take over or replace. It is highly complementary because you know, there's a segmentation happening at work here, which is kind of one level down. Uh, for existing clients, digital will not only give them a better experience that complements the existing experience they're getting from their great advisor, um, but it'll give the advisors a better experience, right? It'll Absolutely. allow them to deliver better services and allow them to do so more easily. And then the, the other segment is for clients who may be, um, you know, either clients that the <laughs> bank doesn't have today uh, because they're a segment that's hard to serve or they're sort of clients the advisor, you know, uh, isn't able to find enough time to, to spend with them and they're always trying to get there but things get in the way, that we can help the advisor scale their efforts across kind of more of their books. So I think that complement um, is there. But, but I'll say this, I think, uh, <laughs> to take the other side of my argument, it, even though they won't take over, there will be parts of... Uh, wealth management, where it will absolutely take over. Right? Tax loss harvesting on an automated basis, that should be done by, by machine. Uh, digital account opening, that should be done by machine. Like The things that advisors do best, they should do more of. But the things that they, to be honest, do a bunch, spend a bunch of time on, that is not what the clients are looking for. It's just a barrier to getting the service. Digital should take over for them. Okay. Um, well, that's uh, one way, uh, uh, of course, that the fintech sector is evolving mm -hmm. yeah, and, and is, I would say, integrating into the traditional uh, financial services sector. 
uh, uh, John, you may have perhaps taken a, a bit of a different approach at HSBC uh, rather than acquire. Uh, you spend several billion dollars uh, a year on technology, and a big part of that is, of course, innovation. And you've, you even have five, uh, 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 five centers, you told me, uh, where uh, innovation takes yep. place at HBCC. So is that, how does that work? Is that where your fintech uh, projects take place? Yeah, so we, we've got a reasonably broad approach to this. So we've got a traditional, if you like, IT development business with inside HSBC that's keeping the lights running and, and keeping software on the existing platforms up to date and current. But again, over the last few years, uh, we've recognized the need to be a lot more open-minded. We used to develop nearly all of our own software. We used to develop things from scratch. We used to recognize the proprietary advantages or we believed in the proprietary advantages of doing this ourselves. Um, and technology has evolved to the point now where we cannot compete on that basis. So we have a much more um, open mind towards this. Um, we are collaborating with all of the, all of the, the, the big names in technology to help improve um, what we do for customers from the beginning to the end. Um, and we are making nascent steps into the VC space as well. So partnering up with firms that are developing technologies that we can see are going to be really interesting for us. So things like digital identity, financial crime, you know, business priorities for HSBC that can be solved or that can be enhanced or enabled through technology will start to, to help some of these customers, uh, right. some of these uh, disruptors grow with us. And so we've got a broad sense. I, I think one other thing just to pick up on in terms of, in terms of impact and, and where um, fintech can actually make a really positive difference to the traditional advisory-based mm -hmm. models. The cost to serve of an advisory, of an advisory model is quite high. Yep. And it does therefore lead you to exclude by model, by business model, big swathes of, of the population that when you consider the demographic trends, over time we'll need to invest and mm -hmm. we'll need to save for ever increasing longevity. And in many markets, there are thresholds beneath which an advisory model just doesn't work economically. And robo-advisory, in its right. broadest sense, has got a crucial role to play there. And, and we, will, we will participate in that too. Um, but that, that sounds, to me, that sounds a bit like, for example, the model that business schools uh, are taking. You have only a selected number of spaces uh, in the school available for people to go, and all the rest uh, can uh, take the, uh, the Coursera online uh, MOOC courses. Uh, of course, also there and in other industries, you've seen that that's not what happens sometimes. It, it remains to be seen uh, uh, whether that's the case or not. But it could also be uh, uh, that also uh, the people uh, with uh, a lots, lot, lots of wealth under management uh, will turn to robo-advising because it's better, because it's cheaper, because whatever reason it is. And so wh wh what do you expect will happen? And, and I want to uh, see a bit the two, two points of view here, because I know, Bo, um, uh, that you have a demographic that is maybe not what we would expect. Could you say something about that? Yeah, sure. So I think millennials are, are oftentimes the headline because, you know, it's tech and that, that's a well-worn story. And, and millennials also in the sense of uh, the people uh, who don't have that much wealth that's yet correct. because normally right. wealth is accumulated over a lifetime and so the people with the highest wealth would be the ones that are, let's say, plus 40. Yeah. So, so from us, uh, if you look at our data, um, more than half of our clients are over 40, and that's by headcount only. And then if you cut it again by assets, assets under management, uh, you know, reflecting Peter's point, uh, more than three quarters come from uh, clients who are, where the head of household is over 40. And so I think even though millennials uh, you know, are often seen as the driver, the data actually belies a different story where people are selecting the service. And I think that here, the, your, your point about um, you know, massively online uh, courses is, uh, is valid, though I think wealth management is a little bit further along that spectrum, right? Like today, it's relatively rare that if you got into Stanford, I'm from, I'm from uh, you know, the Bay Area, that you decide to stay home and take the online course instead. Um, but it's probably happening, right? People are super busy. Uh, and I think, but, it, but here, I think in wealth management, there's starting to be that beginning cadre of people who either because of uh, you know, lower fees or because of transparency, or because they're just too busy to like ever go into the city and, f and talk to somebody, that they're right now deciding to go for digital. Uh, but, but it's a continuum, right? I think that's the thing that I think both of us will we'll agree yeah, on. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's more advisor or less advisor, depending on cost structures and what the client prefers, or more digital and less digital, depending on, you know, those same factors. And so I think you'll see kind of a very equal melding of the two over time. Right. That, that sounds conciliatory. Uh, John, so <laughs> well, I want to get your perspective on this. You, you know, in our preparatory uh, conversation, you, uh, you talked about um, uh, how you saw uh, the importance of the, the boring banker, the, the banker that follows the rules, mm. and that in the end, uh, people are going to follow that. 
uh, rather than the convenience of the um, of the of the robo advisor. Is that what is that the driver that you expect will take over? And, and does will people still come into your office uh, in ten years' time? Yeah, I think that the reality is for most retail investors, the markets uh, and investing is scary. Yep. They're Always not true. comfortable navigating the financial markets. I've been doing this for 26 years, and there are aspects of it that are still quite uncomfortable for me. So for, for your, your average retail investor, um, some have got the confidence to go straight to a robo-advisors and, and, and trust and enjoy the benefit of the simplicity and ease of use and perhaps the lower fees. But our experience through the client base we serve, and it's a, a diverse international client base, is the vast majority of our clients want a conversation with a human being for now. Um, and I, and I, and I th my, my best guess would be five, ten years from now, that would still be the case. But there's absolutely a role to play for execution only at one end of the spectrum where you have fully conversant investors who know what they want to do, they know what they want to buy, and they're happy to do their own risk management and their own risk profiling. You've got other people that are happy to follow an algorithm or be guided by a piece of technology. At the moment, though, across our customer base, the vast majority of um, the customer outcomes that we deliver come through a human contact, a qualified right. advisor. And, and, so uh, you, and based on that uh, experience or that observation, you think uh, it's going to be a, a, a gradual change? My instinct is it'll be a gradual, and gradual change. In five to ten years, most people will still come into, the, into your office and ask your advice. I think for wealth, yes, I still think yeah. there will be the, 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 the primary um, flow of, of wealth revenue will okay. still be driven through a human being. Um, w would you agree, Bo? Well, now that you call me conciliatory, um, <laughs> you know, maybe I'll take the other side. Um, I'll say that I think you know, we should be aware of a very real human cognitive bias that all of us, I mean, many, many human cognitive biases, by the way, uh, it's just one that all of us share, uh, including myself, which is that we underestimate uh, sorry, we overestimate progress in the near term, but then we underestimate its impact and also its direction in the long term. If folks, uh, you know, this is a cultural reference, if you've seen Back to the Future, you realize they had flying cars, uh, but they also had a newspaper. And you're like, well, kind of, you know, <laughs> too far on that one and too, too not far on this one. Uh, and I think looking ahead, uh, it will probably be, you know, slow adoption for a little bit, but then there's an S-curve, well-known S-curve of technology sure. adoption. It's not this way, right? It's slow for a while, and then it, at some point it passes a point of, of no return. And I think that's why, you know, both of our firms are investing so heavily into it, because you kind of have to be, be there when the thing takes off. Um, and I think, you know, we're starting to see from our perspective um, some of that's happening already. Right. Um, I, I want to perhaps also uh, open up the conversation to uh, some of the people in the audience, because I know there's a lot of people interested in this, in this topic. Um, uh, what, what are some of the perspectives of you or questions that you have? Yes? Yeah, uh, Dar, maybe uh, say your name and... and uh, Norman Dar, I'm CEO of HBL, which is the largest bank in Pakistan. Okay. And uh, I mean, the experience that we've had over there is that some of the new technology operators have tried to make it disruptionist, which is not sensible. Uh, the cell companies would not give us uh, the USSD to, to do mobile banking because they said, no, this is for us to do. Mm. So th then we had to wait and go into uh, the smartphone mm. where you can do it yourself. Mm. So like David uh, uh, said, we are investing, so we will be there mm -hmm. at when that time comes. But we firmly believe that this 75 or 100 years of trust is important because what we see that people are doing transactions mm -hmm. with mobile phones, mm -hmm. that with these mobile operators and others, but they're not leaving their money in their mobile wallets. They leave their money in the HSBC, they leave their money in HBL. Right. So, and that is, will take time to change. And, and we feel that if we cooperate more, if we work together, mm. I think we can have a win-win situation but if we have this attitude that we will disrupt uh, the age-old players, then I don't think it's going to be meaningful. Mm. Okay, and uh, thank you. Um, since you uh, uh, didn't ask a question specifically, no, no, I, I will I, ask I it for you. No, no, but that's fine. So I, I, I derived two questions from that. And, mm. and the first would be, uh, what is the role, the, the driver of, the, uh, of what's happening in the, in the financial sector in the future? Is it going to be regulation or trust? Right? Um, uh, regula sorry, regulation and trust, or, or is it going to be uh, the customer uh, centricity? And I would say the, the first part would be 
the traditional banking sector says there is regulation and we have the customer's trust. Hence, uh, uh, we, we won't see so much of the uh, change. Um, and, and perhaps the fintech represents them more. No, we, we, th we look at the client first and that's going to be the, the primary driver. And, and of course, since we have a fintech player and we have a banking player, we can ask, is that, is that also how you see it? The relationship between trust, regulation, and customer centricity. Right. I, I think fintech forces the incumbents to, as I said, really focus on the customer centricity piece. If we do that, mm -hmm. then I think we can continue to rely on trust and regulation to preserve the moat around around the incumbent industry or the old industry. If we lose sight of, if we don't keep up on the customer centricity piece, there's a risk then that that moat becomes redundant and that people can can invade and and, and take and take our customer base. Um, but you know, it's interesting that the, the disruption to date, to the extent it's occurred, has really been around narrow pieces of the value chain. Mm -hmm. The core function of looking after other people's money and then allocating it across an economy productively is a really difficult and expensive and heavily regulated thing to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the new technology um, um, energy doesn't want to commit to that for obvious reasons. Um, so I think, I, for me, um, and I, I appreciate this as a, a view that comes of 26 years of doing it, this and nothing else, um, the, the trust and regulation piece, uh, I think, will dominate over the long run, assuming that we can keep up on the customer side. Right. Bo? Uh, I think I, I largely agree. And I think that but there's a couple, there's a nuance here to point out, though, that trust uh, is necessary, but not. Ne but the delivery mechanism of that trust, like I was talking about earlier, via right. transparency, uh, can be something other than humans, right? And I think you know, in the United States, we have a large broker broker dealers such as Fidelity and Vanguard. You know, people have their entire net saving net worth, or more than they have at the bank, and they've never met a Vanguard employee in their life, right? And people trust uh, an Uber driver that they never will meet and never have met and never will meet to take their kids to after school baseball practice, right? And so if you think about you know those two as the pillars of what I'll trust some you know admittedly random person to do, you know, take my kid's safety and my whole net worth. And I think that's what, that's the boundaries currently of trust building without a human face-to-face -face mm, contact. Right. And I think that's the ceiling. And if we put yeah. a value to that, Bo, uh, uh, if you make your sales pitch, um, uh, where do you, wh what do you say is going to be the level of wealth management done by robo-advisors in, say, let's say, three years and five years? I think I think if we're and successful, and I think this will be maybe weird to hear, if we're successful, there won't actually be such a metric, right? There won't It'll, be an upper limit. No, no, there won't be a metric such as this is managed by robo and this is not managed by robo. I think if we're successful, it'll become a more nuanced conversation of, uh, you know, probably over time, almost all or all financial institutions will allow the scalable things that computers are best at to be done by computers, mm -hmm. right? And 20 years from now, if you're still hand opening accounts, like that's going to be a waste of time and money. Um, <laughs> or if you're, you know, not engaging your customers in a scalable way, like for example, you know, with the recent uh, market turmoil, we have systems that allow advisors to send out very personalized messages uh, with their commentary under their name to each of their uh, of their clients kind of before they wake up, right? And if you don't do that, and you kind of call through your list, by the time you get halfway down the list, people are calling you and saying, hey, well, I haven't heard from you, what's going on? And so I think not only in terms of the back end execution and fulfillment, but also in the front, of the, f the front end customer experience, people will come to expect a digitally enabled level of service. And so I think you know, they'll, they'll just kind of bleed into and blend into the experience that they already have. Right. Um, and then the second question that I, I wanted to ask based on, on your uh, statement, uh, is what, how do you see the difference, let's say, geographically in how this sector is going to evolve? Uh, you operate in, in, in one uh, country. Uh, you say you come from uh, Pakistan. Um, uh, what's going to be, uh, is, how different is that going to be per country and based on what? Is that going to be based on regulation um, or is it going to be based on something else? Where, 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 do, you see, where do you see this going? And, and, and you, we must say, you've, you've spent a lot of your career also in Asia, I think in, in, in Hong Kong, right? Yeah, I mean, investor behavior is vastly different by geography. So Asia, we see a very active, self-directed behavior from uh, from low end of retail all the way all the way to the top. So we've got a very healthy mix of advisory-based um, services as well as execution only, um, and that's partly cultural. Uh, it's partly been fostered by regulation. Mm -hmm. You come to say our, our other largest market, the UK, um, the investor is an awful lot less. Um, inquisitive and a lot less active. Um, and we've had regulation there that, again, has kind of slowed down, I think, the, the ability of many segments of the, 
of the system to invest. So RDRs had, a, 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 I think, some adverse impact right. on, on the ability of people to access the markets and products they need, and that's something we, we need to think, on, think about. I think there, the fundamental answer is each of the societies we serve has different expectations of us as service providers. They have different cultural expectations, and we just need to fit each of those. So there's always a danger in, the, in this debate, I think, that we talk about the customer. The customer's yeah. a really complex thing right. to get underneath and it. They're, they're You've got the geographic def uh, dimensions, and then the point you made earlier on about the generational differences, mm -hmm. it's complex. Where, where do you see this uh, going? And then even within our own data set, actually, we see psychographic differences, depending on how yeah. comfortable you are, what kind of experience you had recently. Uh, and we can see this all in our, in our data about you know, conversion rates and engagement rates, what, what parts of the site or what types of content they engage with the most. Um, I think I think you'll see um, the same thing happen in digital uh, across most markets, but I think um, you should think of digital as, as a tool set that allows the financial institution partner that we work with um, to deliver their values, to deliver what they want their client experience to be like, right? And so if for a particular market, you want your clients to all wake up to a personalized message, um, you know, digital will be the way to deliver that. And for, a partic for another market, you want uh, you know, clients to wake up to a push notification that lets them schedule some time with their advisor, you know, digital will deliver that. And so I think, you know, to take your, your point one point further, it's actually, you know, we will all define what we want as the digital client experience. And my hope, uh, sorry, as the client experience overall, and my hope is that we will be less bound by the uh, business model dynamics or the other constraints of our business because of the ability of digital to give personalized service at scale mm -hmm. uh, in a way that just feels great. And you know, many of our clients, uh, well, don't know, but they might know after after uh, hearing this that the emails they they get that look like they were written by somebody weren't written by somebody. Right? They were right. written by somebody for two thousand people at once who look like you, uh, and th they contain your numbers and you know they contain references to your situation. But that's the machine. And so, so that's so already happening. Yeah. I saw another question over there. So my name is uh, Sumitra. I'm a dean of the business school at Cornell, and I find the discussion very fascinating because I do research in this area. So just one very brief c comment. Uh, at the World Economic Forum, we did research looking at online behaviors across different markets. And what was interesting was we found that people who are online in emerging markets are much more open and willing to experiment in the online behaviors than in more developed markets. So actually, which means that you might find more interesting models, business models emerging in online uh, spaces in emerging markets, especially the center of gravity of, of internet users, most most of the markets. So, a company like HSBC, that you're global, I think that could be interesting to see yeah, what happens. Right. The second, it's a, it's a, it's a second, the second point is a question. I think we have made a lot of distinction between customer centricity and you know and automation and so on. And my question to you is, what if the customer cannot tell the difference between a machine and a human being? And I think that point is not too far away. Already when you chat with many of these online chat bots, you can't really tell. You know? uh, and, and what if sometimes in you know, the near future, the Turing test is essentially passed, you know, mm -hmm. that the customer cannot tell the difference between a human being. So what'll, right. what kind of impact will it have on your business? So, so, so two, two comments, one about uh, emerging markets and how people are more open there. Um, and the second one about uh, human versus uh, robot, which is the central theme here. Uh, so let's uh, let's kick off with the, with, uh, with the first one, um, and 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 maybe boy, you have maybe knowledge about this. I have the imp impression that, that fintech centers uh, right now are uh, London uh, and perhaps mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, where you're from, uh, the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard from Sumitra that uh, the clients might be more in the emerging markets. So wh where, where do you expect that to go? I think it's actually uh, a, a nuanced segmentation question once again, because uh, you'll probably note that many of the folks in emerging markets haven't traditionally had access to uh, you know, a traditional human advisor. Um, but you know, that's the same in the US if you have less than, call it a half million or you know, whatever line you want to use. And so I think to be, you know, rather than looking at it from a country by country distinction, you can see that within a country, particular segments will behave like other segments with the same properties, but may not look like them, but with the same properties uh, in, other, in other markets. You know, so for example, now we've seen that um, there, there's a difference in the way that digital is adopted, depending on whether you come from a traditional advisor that you may not have had a good experience with, or you know may have retired or something like that, versus had you come to us and we're the first advisor you've ever had. We have to teach you about ACATS. We have to tell you about how, hey, we're going to move assets from one institution to another, yeah. and you know it's going to show zero dollars on both sides for a few days. Don't freak out. Uh, and so we had to build a lot of software for that because that first time experience is fundamentally different. Whereas you know for existing uh, clients who know about ACATS, they're like, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Right? Yeah. 
And then uh, the second question was about uh, uh, robots versus humans. So, uh, John. Can I just make a quick comment on the first yeah, question sure. first? Because I, I agree with that observation. I mean, the, the market that is the most progressive with respect to e-commerce that we serve is China. Mm -hmm. um, consumer behavior there is at a different level to any other um, any other market we serve, in, including including the UK or even the, even the US for that matter. So one of our innovation centers is sited in, in Guangzhou, so that we can hopefully take advantage of some of the, the skills and talent that, that exist there. Sorry, the, just remind me of the first. Well, the first we were looking at the more philosophical, and we'll end up uh, on that note, but uh, the, the question of robots versus humans. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 20 years' time or 10 years' time, uh, am I going to work uh, with a, a robot banker or with a human banker? You know, I'm going to cop out a little bit on this. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Um, I, mean, I can absolutely see that robotics stroke AI have got the potential to displace a lot of, a lot of um, low-skilled aspects in what we do. But I think there are some real challenges, um, even in something simple like you know, delivering risk-profiled wealth management solutions to clients. It, a human being needs to be involved somewhere in the process. Somebody needs to be setting the parameters, somebody needs to be writing the rules, somebody needs to be overseeing the governance. From a customer perspective, um, making that, and from a, a, a risk, a reputational risk perspective, making the leap from a bunch of trained humans to avatars, um, you can argue this either way. On the one hand, it reduces your risk because you've got a single control point, a single mm -hmm. focal point. Um, that's fine as long as you get all the assumptions right in the rules that you set and the behaviors right. that you allow and the behaviors you don't allow. Um, I'm really interested to see how this evolves, um, and I think we, this will that will definitely be a slower burn than, if I'm going to be a bit provocative, I think it'll be a slower burn than some of the disruptors think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we've run out of time, so I'll uh, maybe let you just uh, make a closing statement, each of uh, you. So where do you expect uh, uh, the, the future of financial services to be in FinTech? I think, um, so I'm going to take part of my statement and address your question, which is, uh, it doesn't have to be all for all. Right, like t it'll as long as we chip away at the kind of low value services that today are done by humans, we will dramatically change the cost structure and the business models in the industry. And that has great externalities for societies because it allows you know there's great research that says if you have a financial plan, you feel better, you have a better financial outcome, uh, and. You know, in the U.S., I think the research shows that only half of pre-retirees and retirees, arguably the group that most needs it, have, have a financial advisor. Uh, and so if we can get that penetration up, it'll be great overall for everybody's outcomes. Um, and I think, you know, to your point, it's, you know, how long is it going to be until we, uh, until we get to a point where it's all, all computer, like every last thing, <laughs> probably a while. Um, but, you know, even today, we're already at a point where sometimes you actually don't know. Yeah, no. And that's, that's okay, right? Um, so. Okay. John, any final remarks? Um, no, I, mean, I, I think just come back to something I said uh, perhaps at the outset. I, th I think the incumbent firms now, nearly all of us feel a lot more confident around this challenge. Um, and, and the way forward for us is to embrace new technology. Um, the customer wins. The customer benefits. Whatever, whatever happens from here, the customer is probably going to get a better customer experience and they're almost certainly going to get cheaper products and services. Um, if we apply the new technologies right, we've got the ability to take costs out, to your point. So. Again, we've got, we've got the potential to use new technologies to manage our own P&L. Um, but I think if we, just, if we just focus on the end result for the customers, um, I, I, I don't really want the debate to be about good, or, good versus evil, winners versus losers. It's going to be a more or complex answer. Robots. Mm -hmm. Or even okay. human versus uh, robots. Thanks very much, uh, both of you, and thanks to the audience for being here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.